Hello! That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no. I really always wanted to be a circus master. So I ended up this. Um, yeah, welcome again to Minds, Technology, and Society. Uh, and we thank you to the uh, Glushko and Samuelson Foundations for funding. Today our speaker is Professor Peter Todd from Indiana University. Um, really excited to have Professor Todd here. He is the chair of the Cognitive Science Program at Indiana uh, and a professor of psychological and brain sciences as well as informatics. Um, he did his PhD at Stanford and then spent many years at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development as a co-founder of the Adaptive Behavior and Cognition Group along with Gary Gigerenzer. Uh, and he's been in Indiana, I think, since 2005. Uh, published many, many things, edited many books on many topics, including search and decision making and mate choice and evolution and modeling and experiments and big data and all sorts of cool stuff, uh, some of which he'll talk to us about today. So uh, let's give a big welcome to Peter Todd. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction, Paul. And uh, I've been hearing from people throughout the day so far. Well, first of all, this is my first time here, and it's great to be here because I've been looking forward to seeing what's happening here. Uh, several people have said to me how um, the cognitive science folks here look to IU as an example of a cognitive science program, but I can tell you that we are looking at you guys as an example of what can you do when you get to start over afresh. So our program is, is uh, 25 years old and we've gone in a certain path and it, it works well in, in lots of ways, but there are things that we can definitely learn from what you guys are, are doing. Uh, starting a, a new program and it's super exciting to see so I look forward to those kinds of interactions continuing and um, there's lots of connections between our programs already I look forward to those developing even more like those of you who are looking for graduate positions or even jobs keep us in mind and we do the same with, with our people coming out here so today I want to tell you a bit about some of the research that we've been doing for a few years on uh, how people search for things, how people look for the resources that we need. And I've been sort of expanding what I think that means to bigger and bigger spheres over time. And now sort of I'm at the stage where I think that basically the question here is how do people and other organisms decide when to give up and when to keep doing what they've been doing? And that is the exploration, exploitation trade-off, as, as I will explain to you. But what we're going to be looking at is how agents look for resources. And we have to look for resources whenever the things that we need, whenever those resources aren't all right in front of us right now, but rather are distributed in space or time. And that happens in a lot of different domains. It happens in the domain of stuff that we need to keep our bodies going, so food and water. Happens in the domain of looking for a place to live. Happens in the domain of looking for social partners, which could be mates, could be friends, could be scientific collaborators, as we've been looking at a bit lately. It can also be in immaterial things in terms of information, and that information can be information that is internal to us in our heads, or that's, that's that one internal in our memory or external out in the world, potentially in other people's heads or in artifacts. And a lot of these things happen not only in sort of ancestral domains like those, but also in modern settings as well. And so we can look at how do people search specifically for houses or for jobs or for goods that they're going to buy or things they're going to be entertained by. And for all of these kinds of domains, you may find a resource that you like, but there's always going to be this possibility that there could be something that you would like better or that you would get more value out of still out there. This is especially the case if the thing that you currently have is something that you're using up. So something that you're eating or <coughs> that you're getting some enjoyment from, but that enjoyment decreases over time, then that means at some point there's gonna be something else that's better out there that you could go get. 
And then this leads to the question of, do I give up on what I've got now, or do I stay with it? If I give up on this one, I can go look for something that might be better. So that's this real problem of when to stop search and exploit the current thing that we've got, or keep exploiting it, and when to keep looking, or when to return to looking uh, for something new, so to explore some more. And this explore exploit trade-off is something that we have to do in an ongoing fashion in lots of different domains. There's some kind of search problems where we might just explore for a while and then stop and stay with that thing for a long time. That could be in, say, the search for a partner for long-term marriage or living together or the search for a job that you want to have for a long time. But even those things, those can also end and can return to search again. So really this process is ongoing between exploring for a while, exploiting for a while, exploring for a while, exploiting for a while. And I should say, if people have questions as, as I'm going, please uh, stop me and, and we can engage in discussions as, as we go along as well. I'm serious. Yeah, no, I have a question. Okay. okay. So like the interaction between like stopping and beginning search, does that like uh, the interaction with like, I'm searching, do you think there's some like hysteresis to me as a searcher to continue searching and pass up something that is actually a good place to stop? Like I'm kind of like an object in motion that takes up to the larger um, resource deposit for me to actually stop if I'm in like a really kind of exploratory mode. Could be, but I think that would be probably less likely than hysteresis in the exploit mode because you're exploring in order to find something that you need. So if you're designed to keep rolling right past this thing that you need, that's not a very good search out of it. Right. But if you've got something and you're getting something out of it, sticking with that maybe longer than, than you actually should, that is something that we would expect to see more common. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So life without search would be actually rather boring. There aren't that many examples of organisms that you can find that don't engage in search. Sea creatures that sit on the bottom of the seafloor and just wait for everything to come to them, they're not engaged in much search. They just filter stuff out of the water and don't have to go searching for it. But even that's a lie because these guys, when they are larvae, they have to swim around and search for a place that they're going to plop down and stay for the rest of their lives. So they engage in the search early in their lives. Humans, we engage in a lot of search, but we also try to minimize our search as much as we can. And so we're sort of maybe turning into filter organisms just waiting for things to be delivered to us by Amazon drones and not have to go out and find stuff ourselves. But I take that as another example of the importance of search, that we spend time figuring out how can we get around this costly process of search in order to get the stuff that we want. So most animals <coughs> indeed have to engage in this search process. And these search mechanisms, I think, may be more than just about how we're finding these resources, they may be these building blocks to other aspects of our cognition. In particular, looking for information is something that we spend a lot of our cognition doing and then processing that information. And the action of having to decide when to do one kind of activity and when to do another one, action selection, is another basic foundation of, of our cognition. So search is underlying these fundamental things that we have to do in order to be cognitive beings. And so this is a big part of what's going on, I think, in, in our heads throughout our lives. And in order to get a better handle on it, we also want to look at how are other animals doing this and in particular in the kinds of ways that, that animals forage for different resources that, that they need. So we're gonna talk about that today, starting with the animal foraging strategies. 
And then look at how humans do some of our search as well in patchy environments. And we'll talk about what a patchy environment means. That's where the challenge of search is particularly pressing, both in sort of physical space and also in more abstract information spaces as well, and in social and cultural spaces to tell you a bit about some of the, the new directions that we're looking at, whether or not we can see traces of foraging behavior in the ways that modern humans are looking through cultural spaces as well. And a lot of this stuff gets covered in one of the books that I put together uh, called Cognitive Search, which came out of an uh, interdisciplinary meeting of psychologists and computer scientists and biologists and neuroscientists and others who are facing the question of how we search from lots of different perspectives. As Paul mentioned, I spent a bunch of years at a Max Planck Institute uh, putting together a research group with Gerd Gegerenzer looking at how people and animals make decisions under the kinds of cognitive constraints that we face. And that presents a different view of cognition from the standard sort of uh, rational approach to cognition that often comes across as being superhuman, of expecting that we can or should make our decisions on the basis of all the information we could possibly gather and process it fully and, and optimally. In contrast, what people are usually really doing is making their decisions with these particular bounds and constraints on our cognition. And having limited time, having limited information that we can gather in our limited time, and having limited ability to process that information to, to come up with the decisions for what we're going to do. And what I'm going to be telling you about today in terms of search mechanisms is comes within this framework. You can take an optimality-based perspective on search and say, what ought you to do if you could have unlimited resources and time? But that's not what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be looking at what do real organisms with the real constraints that they face do to solve their search problems. And taking this bounded rationality perspective gives us a view of the mind as containing a lot of different simple decision strategies that can be used to solve different kinds of problems. So the mind, in that perspective, is viewed as an adaptive toolbox of lots of different ways of solving problems that are fit to different particular settings. So the adaptive toolbox is this collection of different kinds of decision mechanisms. A lot of them are simple heuristics. A lot of them are created through evolution. Some are learned by individuals or from one's parents or one's culture. And they are by and large domain specific in that they will work on some tasks and not on others. You can't use one tool on all different problems you might face. But because they are domain specific, they can also rely on there being particular structures in the environment that enable them to work. And that's part of the reason why they can be simple, is because there's some structure that are in the mental mechanisms in our head, and it's relying on some matching structure out in the environment. And when you use the right tool with the right structure from your adaptive toolbox in the right setting in the external environment, they fit together well and allow you to make appropriate decisions in that particular setting. And that leads to what we call ecological rationality, which is bounded rationality, but emphasizing the importance of the ecology of the environment. And there's loads of other books that you can find out more about what we've done on that. This first one was on the idea of looking at these simple heuristics. The second one was focusing on what's the structure in the environment that those heuristics are going to match to. And the third one is focusing on what happens when the environment is not 
uh, made up of inanimate things, but is made up of other decision-making agents, so social environments. Okay, so we're gonna talk about foraging and particularly this question of how to decide when you've got enough out of one resource and it's then time to leave that resource behind and go find a new resource. What animals have to do when they are facing a foraging problem, we can break up into three main kind of components. So the first one is the aspect of exploring, so finding a resource, which could be a single item or could be a whole collection of items, which is a patch. Staying with that item or patch for as long as you're getting something good out of it. But over time, that may decrease, and that may lead then to needing to decide when to leave that resource and go and find a new one. So switching from the exploiting in step two back to the exploring of step one, ongoing process. We want to know how people are doing this in different kinds of domains. And so again, we're focusing on patches which are collections of resources that are near to each other, near in whatever way we're defining nearness in a particular space, so if it's physical space, then physical distance. And where the organism is using up the things that it finds in the patch over time, but also doesn't know how much stuff is in the patch and whether or not necessarily there's anything left in that patch without putting in more effort, without doing local search to find stuff in that patch. So you can think about a berry bush that's covered with berries, and as you are picking the berries, there's fewer berries left on the bush, you don't know exactly how many more berries that are left there. There could be some that are hidden under some leaves and you have to keep looking for them, but you have to decide if it's worth it. Are there going to be more that I could dig through the thorns in order to find, or should I leave this bush now and go and find a new bush somewhere else? And so that's what, for instance, this bird is having to decide, I've found some stuff in this patch, I don't know how much more is left, should I stay or should I go? Behavioral ecologists have thought about this problem a lot and how animals uh, do solve it and also how animals could perhaps solve it optimally or rather what would be the optimal solution whether or not animals could achieve that and the optimal way of deciding when to leave is when the rate of return that you're currently getting in a patch falls below what you could expect to get from this environment overall if you went through the exploration and exploitation trade-off optimally back and forth. So as soon as your rate of return falls below this expected threshold, that's when you should leave. And that's what the marginal value theorem says. There are some implications of that theorem that we can look for in organisms' behavior, including humans. So first of all, the prediction from the marginal value theorem that a forager should leave the patch when its current rate of return falls below the overall mean rate of return. That means also that foragers, foragers should stay longer in better patches because their rate of return there is gonna be above the mean for longer. If it takes more time to get from one patch to the next patch, the implication then is that you should stay longer in your current patch because going off to find the next patch is going to be a big hit to your overall return and it's better to stay longer getting some return in the current patch where you are. So if the travel time between patches increases, foragers should stay longer in each patch that they're in. But it's difficult to figure out what would be this optimal point for an organism to decide, okay, 
now I have reached that threshold. How do they know what that threshold is? How do they know what their mean rate of return uh, would be in the environment? And as a consequence, organisms typically use, instead of an optimal approach, a simple heuristic to guide their behavior, to tell them when they should leave a patch. So for instance, one of the kinds of simple heuristics that's been explored amongst foragers and foraging birds amongst others is a rule called a, a giving up time rule, which says that after it's been too long since you found something in your current patch, you should give up on that patch and leave and go find another patch. So there's a specific amount of time, and if it's been longer than that time, that giving up time, then give up. So we can see that in this graph here, where we've got the tendency for the bird to stay in its current patch, high to low, and the time that it's spending on the patch on the x-axis. Um, so if there are a lot of resources on a patch, like a bird feeder, would they still just leave if it's been a long time, just because it's been a long time? If it's been a long time since they like got since something they out of the bird oh, feeder, okay. then yes, that's okay. what okay. matters, right? So if they're just eating, right. there's not a long time going yep. between the next seed that they get. So they've got they've got other reasons to leave in that case, like squirrels coming or other birds chasing them away or cats pawing at the window on the other side of the bird feeder, like at our house. So. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't otherwise leave until basically the, the seed was gone or they were too heavy to fly. <laughs> so this graph is showing how this kind of mechanism could work, a giving up time mechanism. How long the bird's been on the patches here on the x-axis, and these marks are indicating when the bird is finding, let's say, not a, a seed, but like a grub uh, in a patch of, of grass or something. And so the tendency to stay starts at some value when, when the bird first lands in the patch, and then it falls over time as it's not finding anything. As soon as it finds, like the first grub, then it resets its tendency to stay, and then it falls again, finds another grub, it resets its tendency to stay, falls again, finds another grub, resets, and keeps falling now, but now it's not finding anything within that time, and after its tendency to stay reaches this low threshold, then it leaves, which also means after it's been on the patch for this amount of time without finding something, it leaves. So that's the giving up time kind of heuristic. For this heuristic, is it ever, like if you find 10 grubs in a row when you first get there, can it get above that initial value, or does it always get to that and then just decay from there? The way that this particular heuristic goes, it doesn't go above uh, the initial um, threshold for a tendency to stay. Uh, there are other heuristics, so there's an incremental heuristic, which is more like winding up a timer with every new item that you find, it adds more time to it. So that if you find a bunch of things in a row, it would just keep going up. Um, and then when you stop finding things, then it starts winding down after that. Yeah. So, and you can find evidence for both kinds of heuristics being used by different species in different environmental conditions. So we wanted to find out amongst the different ways that have been explored for uh, how animals do foraging, what do humans do? And we wanted to make some patchy uh, foraging decision, leaving decisions for people to engage in. One of the questions that we had was, since people, humans are, are generalists, that is we eat a lot of different kinds of things, we look for a lot of different kinds of resources, maybe we're good at adjusting to environment structures and using different kinds of giving up, or uh, sorry, patch leaving decisions in different kinds of settings. So we wanted to see what happens when we change the environment structure. And we also wanted to see, do people forage internally in the same way that we forage externally. So we made some different kinds of tasks. This was not one of them. This is, you might think, okay, if you want to have a spatial kind of patchy foraging task, well, you could hide stuff and have people search for it. And 
Uh, others have done this kind of a task. We wanted to have more control over the um, patch structure, and we didn't want to have to keep putting M&Ms under these film canisters all day. So we made some computer-based tasks that looked like this. We had a phishing task for external search equivalent and a word puzzle task for an internal search equivalent. And I'll tell you more detail about both of those. But one of the things to have in mind is we tried to make them as kind of equivalent to each other as we could in terms of what people had to do what the patch structure, environment structure was like, so that we could say, okay, when we're analyzing the data, are they doing the same or different things between these two kinds of tasks? So what they look like, I'm gonna skip over all those words, the, the fishing task involved coming into the lab and controlling a little fisher guy who would walk <coughs> onto the screen and over to a pond and in this pond, there were a number of fish, which you don't know how many there are to begin with. You don't know how many there are at any point, actually. Every once in a while, a fish would rise to the surface, would appear somewhere on the surface, and you just had to move your hook over to the fish, and you would catch it easily. And then the fish would go into your bucket, and you would see how many fish have you caught so far from this pond. As you catch fish, there's fewer fish in the pond. The number that's there is going down. You just don't know how many there are. And with fewer fish, it takes longer until the next one randomly, stochastically uh, appears at the surface. So the average time between fish is lengthening. And as you're going, you have to decide, you know, it's been a while since I caught the last fish. Should I keep waiting? Are there more fish in here? Or should I leave this pond and go to the next one? And as soon as you decide that's what you want to do, then you press the big red next pond button, and your little guy goes walking off the screen, walks around for a while, and then walks back onto the screen to a new pond, and you do the same thing again. So there is a travel time between ponds, which is a key factor in this experiment so that nobody would want to just catch one fish, go to the next pond, catch one fish, go to the next pond, because you'll be wasting a lot of your time in between ponds. And people are getting paid for how many fish they catch within the roughly hour-long session that they have. So they have an incentive to get this trade-off between exploration and exploitation uh, as right as they can. Yeah, is the travel time between ponds always the same in case someone decides to opt out and move to another? It is, yeah. We varied it between subjects, but each, each participant would experience the same travel time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you guys ever try a version of this where the ponds didn't deplete, and so you're, instead of searching for whether or not your pond is dying out, you're just going, well, maybe I actually just have a bad pond, right? Um, and sure, sure, determine that. Sort of like if you're like doing slot machines, right? You don't know if you have a good slot machine or not. They all have the same probability. They all actually have the same probability, right? But there's that um, that phenomenological experience of that, right? So we didn't do that. I think it would be hard to think of what natural setting that would apply to, or do you have something in mind? Because well, normally you would be depleting things, and so. But I'm not thinking like fishing, and if you're the fisherman on the pond, and it's a decent sized pond, you're not really depleting the pond in a significant way, right? If you're fishing by yourself. So there, okay, so there you could say there's just going to be some sort of constant rate uh, that I'm experiencing right. over the over long term. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I think it's a good question to know how. How would you get people to, to be thinking of it that way as opposed to thinking of it as, as something that, that they're depleting? Maybe you could tell them there's really a lot of fish in here um, and you're not going to ever run out of them, but it takes uh, different amounts of time for them to show up where you are or something. That, that would be interesting to look at. We didn't do that. I mean, so there's still the, the issue, though, that you don't know if you've picked a good fishing hole. Right, and, and does that tap into the same mechanism for exploration versus exploitation, um, like this search for the quality of the spot? 
That's right. So it, it becomes a different kind of problem and it would be more, you know, like a, a multi-armed bandit kind of problem of there's a probability of payoffs of, like you're saying, like a gambling kind of task. And that's more what you would be doing in that case is trying to learn what is going to be my mean payoff here as opposed to my mean payoff is, or my, my payoff at any moment is falling and I have to decide when to so it is, it is a different kind of mechanism that you would expect to be, to be used. Okay. So that was that task. And then the word puzzle task was like a Scrabble task where now we gave the patch that we gave people was a set of random letters that they had to create words out of. These uh, experiments were run in Germany, so the words that you see here are German. Uh, and what the participants had to do was type in a word that they thought they could make from those letters. The letters wouldn't go away, they could just use you know, one of instance of each of the letters for each of the words that they were making. And they would find out if the word was an acceptable word or not. That's why we have this extra step here in this case. they type the letter A that's not in the letter set, so they're told, no, that's not, you didn't catch that word, that wasn't a possible word. For all the words that were possible, they would go into their word bucket, and they just had to think of more words that they could come up with from those letters over time. And of course, that gets harder and harder, and you have to decide again, should I keep on trying to think of words here from this particular patch, or should I leave and go to the next patch and do the same thing. And again, they would get paid for how many they found over the course of the experiment. Did you happen to analyze the mistakes that people made? In terms of wrong words that they typed in? No, that was not our interest. Is there is there an interesting question there? Um, I was just wondering what kinds of uh, phonological or semantic mechanisms were at play. Yep. And different types of associations. Absolutely. So we did do that for the, the good words. So we looked at like how, how are they going from one correct solution to the next correct solution? Were they flipping letters because that would be, you know, same letter set and that would be acceptable um, or substituting a new letter in. Uh, so we, we did do some of that and looked at how they were doing kind of local search, at least for some of the time, and then bigger jumps to quite different kinds of words at, at other times as well. Yeah, And more of that comes up in the next example that I'll, I'll show you as well, where how people are, are doing the search is very much of interest to us. I was wondering if um, people were able to like change their perspective on the search for each word, like if they were able to click a button to randomize the letters mm. so that they were able to maybe spend more time and exploit that resource more. Yeah, we didn't do that. That's a nice idea. And that is in some of the kind of Scrabble game, right, that you can do that. Yeah, um, I think we didn't, we didn't have that in mind. Um, it, I'm not sure how I would then include that in the analysis. Um, that seems like taking a big step or something, um, but it's not leaving the patch, so it would be an added thing to try to figure out what, how do we work that into to trying to understand what people are doing here. I, I was just going to say, I think it's re related to just their perspective on the patch, like almost like moving around, so just seeing yeah. things differently. About yeah, that. yeah, no, that sounds right. Yeah. Which I don't know about theory for that, actually. So. Actually, uh, David Kirsch did that not too long ago, two years ago or so. Yeah. And uh, what he described it as it was teleporting within that patch. So you're going from uh, one position to another position, kind of without control over uh, any conti uh, any states between those two. That's great. Was it a Scrabble task? Yeah. Same sort of idea, oh, except cool. they just okay. had this randomized button to jam. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, please send me a link if you can. Yeah, sure. That'd be perfect. Thanks. And, and I presume it helped them to 
to stay in the patch for longer? Or? Uh, yes, they didn't have the option to switch from one patch to another, but it helped them generate way more words than okay. uh, the control. So. so in that case, they were just supposed to be exhausting what they could come up with. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's sort of an intermediate uh, leaving, yeah. uh, sort of repositioning, so that it would be interesting to know if people decide to do that, based on the same kinds of judgments that they're deciding when to go to a whole new patch. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So this is what data can look like from those kinds of experiments where for zooming in on one of these, we've got time on the x-axis and we've got the number of items that are being found on the y-axis. Each of the blue lines is the path within one particular patch. So like the top patch here would be, and it doesn't even matter if this is fish or words, so we'll say it's fish, is they caught a fish very soon after a couple of seconds, then no fish for a few seconds, caught another fish, no fish, caught another fish, and so on, up to the black stars in each case are the switch points when they decide to go to the new one. And so what we wanted mainly to find out was can we explain the decisions to switch? How are people deciding when to switch? Oops. So we get rid of the paths and we just look at the switch points and we look at, in this case, what's the best fitting line through the switch points and, and try to see what kind of mechanism can be accounting for that. Just in the blank slide. Um, so, <coughs> We came up with, our biologists working with us came up with uh, uh, dynamic programming solutions to what would be the optimal kinds of decision thresholds to have. Maybe I'll go back to this slide for that. Um, for different kinds of environments. And if you are in an environment where uh, all of the patches have the same size, then you should switch after you reach that number of things that you expect. So like if all of the ponds have 10 fish in them, then after you've caught 10 fish, then you should leave that pond. And what that would look like would be everybody leaving after 10 fish had been found. So it would be a line of black stars going across at the items equal 10 point or maybe nine. If there is a Poisson distribution of the number of items across the, uh, the patches, then when you find any given item, that's not telling you any useful information about how big that patch is. And in that kind of case, you should leave after a fixed amount of time. You don't know how many things are in there, so just spend the same amount of time in each patch. And that would mean a line of leaving decisions that are all at one particular time, like 250 seconds or something. If, on the other hand, you have a distribution, an aggregated distribution of items in the patches, which means most of the patches have kind of a medium amount of stuff in them, but there's a few patches that have a whole bunch of stuff in it, then you want a strategy which will help you to stay longer in that patch if you are finding more stuff in that patch. The more things you're finding, the longer you should stay. What that means is that we should see a relationship just like this for the leaving points. The more things you find, the longer you should stay in the patch. And what we found from people's behavior was that whether we gave them any of those three kinds of environments, always their behavior looked like this. They applied this kind of rule of stay longer, the more good stuff you're getting to all of the different environment structures and also to both the fishing foraging and the word foraging, the external foraging and the internal foraging. So that was a big and interesting finding that people are foraging in this internal task in the same way they're foraging in the external task. And that kind of rule, I should say, is what you get with a giving up time rule. So 
when you use the giving up time rule, the more stuff you find, the longer you stay in the patch. Also, this, the incremental kind of rule achieves the same thing. So, what we found was the more resources that people found in a patch, the longer they stayed in it. They decided to leave after it had been too long since the last thing that they had found, so that's the giving up time, that's the gut rule. And that behavior, following that simple heuristic, allowed them to do a very good job to get close to optimal as predicted by the marginal value theorem in these, all of these different kinds of environments that, that we put people in. Um, I may have missed this, but it seemed like also for the giving up time, that it, um, the amount of time that's spent before giving up increases the number of things there, or sorry, the, it was inversely proportional to the number of things they'd found. So like in the ones they'd found a bunch of things so far, they gave up sooner once they'd stopped finding things. Um, it looked like that on some of the, the previous slide. Do you mean and, on here? No, the one I had just the individual distribution, that one. Um, and I don't know if that was true for the rest of the day, I was just curious. So, you mean that it's, it's kind of going like this, right? Well, no, it's like if you look at the, the number of times they've, um, so if you look at the distance between the last thing they found and the star, oh, that gets okay. smaller the number, the, the higher up they've got, so the more things they found, right? Um, I was wondering, if, I don't know if that was true for all the data or anything, just look at that graph. Generally not, but okay. some people did do a different kind of behavior, which is kind of indicated by this, which is, uh, so I'm not finding anything here. I'd really like to leave, but I'm going to stay until I find the last one. And then as soon as I find one more, then I leave right away. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, uh, a pattern of behavior that we do see pretty commonly. But that is not uh, predicted, actually, by um, the analyses of heuristics that, that people have done. OK, well, I was going to say, it seems like it would follow from some um, like reinforcement learning stuff, like the idea that um, so the more one-to-one -one the ratio is in reinforcement learning, the quicker or the shorter um, extinction is um, once you stop giving them things. Right. Right. So I was wondering. Yeah. That's what I was wondering if that follows. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. I would have to look at, at how whether or not that pattern plays out in the data. Again, it was. Definitely a minority of people, like a small set of people, who are okay. who are showing that. Yes. But, but yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I was wondering too. You gave them just fish, right? And and people. And the incentive was just you know get as many words or catch as many fish. But if you we change paid them the in size, real money. We didn't pay them in fish. <laughs> <laughs> but if you change the size and the value of the fish, oh, yes. is that coming up? Um, no, it's not okay. coming up. We didn't want to do that because that makes it more complicated. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we just would the pattern still hold? Do you think, perceivably? Um, yes, but it would be complicated by um, people assessing. Well, how much resource did I just find? Are the sizes so? Even though I keep on getting fish at a constant rate, the size of the fish is going down. That could make people leave. We didn't want to add that extra complication, extra bit of realism, but we didn't want to include that in the, in the study. But I would definitely expect it would have an influence. Other questions on that? Oh, now it appears. Well, you know, okay. I've already told you about that. Uh, okay, so. We wanted to continue with looking at um, how and whether these foraging kinds of behaviors that are found for external space get applied by people in other kinds of domains as well. The internal foraging that I just showed you, we actually gave them the patches, right? Because we gave them the, the set of random letters that they had to make words out of. So we wanted to look at what happens when people are making their own patches internally and see how they navigate those. And so for that, we switched to a different kind of internal search. And none of the words on there say that. So I'm just going to go to what it is, which is a semantic fluency search. 
And that's the kind of task which I think lots of you are familiar with, uh, where you ask somebody to name all the animals they can say in three minutes or one minute or ten minutes, or all the kinds of foods that they can come up with, or occupations, or cities, etc. And when you do that, you find that people produce things in what looks like clusters. So they say a bunch of one thing, and then they kind of tail off of that, and then they think, and then come up with a new burst of items and say those for a while, and then that tails off. And so we wanted to see, are people deciding when to leave those clusters, those patches, in a way also that conforms to the marginal value theorem? Are they doing a good job of making their switches? So we got data from a bunch of undergrads and started looking at it. This is just an example of what that looks like. If you ask people to say animals, most people in our experiments start by saying dog, then cat, and then maybe a couple of other pets, hamsters and ferrets, and then run out of steam, pause for a moment, and then think, oh, farm animals, and come up with goat and chicken and pig and horse, pause for a second, and then might think of sea animals, and then start going through some of them. And we can look at when people look like they're switching between patches, which correlates with how long it takes them to get from one word to the next word, that looks like a jump, but we can also look at the semantic distance between the words to see if people are moving more in semantic space, and that's another indicator that they are switching from one cluster to another. And we can look at how good of a job are they doing in making, deciding when to leave a patch. So from here, making this switch to find a new one. And from here, making a switch to find a new one. Are they deciding when to leave a patch at an appropriate point? I'm just wondering if uh, the, the items that sort of signal a switch of categories, if there was any sort of relation to like prototype theory, if those items tend to be like prototypical elements, more or less, of their category, or if it was, just, it was not, if you couldn't tell. Did you say that precede a switch? That indicate a switch. So like okay, the first, indicate. so we, a bunch of pets, and then yeah. goat. All right, it, like are the things that sort of indicate it, are sort of the top of the list of new ca members of a new category, are they, they tend to be prototypical? Yeah, so the things that people say when they're starting a new patch, and that's why I asked you if it was preceding. So it's not preceding, it's, it's post-seeding a, a patch switch. Those are not necessarily prototypical, but they're high frequency animals. So the model that we came up with is one of, um, when you start the, the task, you're at the global level of search, you come up with a high frequency animal that plops you down into the animal space and then you do local search for a while around that first thing that you said and once you're not finding things nearby readily enough then you pop back up to the global level find another high frequency animal and, and then search in that area of the space and keep going back the uh, high frequency explanation makes a lot of sense to me, but I kind of in the same vein as Paul's question, uh, do these uh, words that come after these switches potentially also share features with the category that they were switching from? So for instance, you say goat, I can think of a couple of pet goats that I know. Uh, and similarly, when you switch to flounder, there's a couple, or I eat flounder more often than sea lion or dolphin. Uh, is it possible that there's sort of this uh, back relation, so uh, something related to what I was searching for already is what I'm most likely to find in the category of high frequency words in this other category? There could be. We didn't see evidence of that. Um, we trying to think in what ways did we look for that. I think we didn't have specific hypotheses about what that would be like. Um, so it, it could be that there's something in there, and if we had a particular thing to look at in terms of feature overlap, that we might see something. Yeah. It's easy to get more data and, and be able to work. Ooh. 
So we wanted to look, so one of the questions is uh, when are people actually switching from one patch to another? And um, there's various ways that you can look at how this patch switch happens. Like I said, we uh, focused on looking at long times between successive items and also uh, big semantic distance between successive items. And then we wanted to ask this question of do people stay in a patch an appropriate amount of time? And specifically, while it takes little time for them to find the next category item, that is, while they're still producing a lot of things quickly within this patch. And that means when the inter-item retrieval times are less than the overall mean. So we wanted to see, are they conforming to the optimality predictions of the marginal value theorem? And so we looked at the amounts of time that people are taking uh, to get from one word to the next before they switch and after they switch. And we found that, indeed, that is the case. That's what's going on in this graph here. On the x-axis, we have the order of entry of these words relative to a patch switch. So this is a patch switch. This word now is the first word of the next patch. This was the last word in the previous patch and the second last word and so on. And these are the successive words in the next patch. And what we have on the y-axis is the ratio of that time between words, the IRT, to the mean time between words for this particular subject across the entire experiment. So this value of one means that any bar that is at one, like this one here, means it's close to uh, the mean IRT. The time that on average they take to produce the second to last word is starting to get close to the mean IRT that they have in the entire experiment. All of the words before that are coming out faster. The first switch to the next, or the first word produced in the next patch takes longer. So they are leaving a patch when it takes them longer than the average to find the next word. And so that is an indication of them doing a good job of the timing and coming close to what the uh, marginal value theorem would say. Uh, looking at, at this graph, does do people switch patches like every five words? They switch order? very quickly. Yeah. yeah, they are not staying very long on average in patch. Even like two or three words in a row on patch. Yeah. Okay. So that at least is what happens initially when you get people doing it for longer. Um, they can stay longer. Once people remember, oh yeah, butterflies are, are animals, and I used to study or catch butterflies, then they might come up with a, with a whole bunch of them. So what was the duration of the, the given trial for this? Uh, this one was three minutes that we did. So, it, so there's not much, not much time to linger. Really. Not, sorry? Not, not too much time to linger like in any patch. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they could have if they wanted to, but they didn't. I was just wondering if the participants, this question may be less relevant, seeing how the time frame is a little bit uh, smaller than I was expecting from spending on one patch, but I was just wondering if, like, if the participants are able to accurately report how often they were switching, or like, you know, versus their actual performance of switching close to often. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we now are asking people, um, we're transcribing as they're, as they're going as much as we can, and then we ask them, where do you think you switched? And um, where they say that they switched matches up pretty well with what we would predict by the, the duration and the, the semantic distance. I don't have the numbers for you because that actually is, is ongoing. That's a new thing that we hadn't thought of looking at before. Also, partly some of these things are being done remotely, and so we could have set it up to do that, but we weren't collecting that data. Um, so the subject switches when their mean IRT, or when their current IRT passes their mean IRT. But I guess what I'm curious about is that it seems like before you have that first one that passes, your mean IRT is lower, right? So like, are they, it seems like there's that threshold must change throughout the experiment, or do they have some, like, um, predetermined one that is then all the that. So saying that they 
that this is when the switches happen doesn't mean that's how they're deciding when to switch, right? So the mechanism that they that are applying sense. could be different, and we don't actually know yet what is the mechanism that, that they are applying. Um, so this is really a summary of what what is the behavioral outcome of whatever they are doing. And the behavioral outcome is that they're doing a good job of timing when they are switching, that they're moving on when is appropriate for them to maintain a high rate of production overall. So it looks like people are searching for semantic items in memory in patches that they construct in ways that are predicted by the marginal value theorem. And they're staying in a patch while it's more profitable than leaving the patch and exploring to find another one. And that helped us to think that, yeah, it looks like there are commonalities be between how people are searching in space and how other animals search in space and, and how we search for information in memory in particular. And as I mentioned, we're still trying to find what are the actual rules that people are using as opposed to what I just showed you, the behavioral level outcomes. Sorry, I just have one more question about the previous slide. Great. So is the, long, uh, is the longest delay for goat or is it for uh, uh, hamster or whatever? Is, is, that, is it that I try to come up with something and then I can't for a second and a half and so then I switch? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is this is the time uh, between hamster and goat. Okay, great. Thank you. So there there's two things going on in that bar, which we also need to figure out ways of splitting apart. One is how long am I still trying to come up with some other pet beyond hamster? I give up, and then I need to produce goat. Probably producing goat is not going to be taking too long because it's producing high frequency uh, words, but we don't know exactly how those two split up. Do they get exhausted after a certain number of switches and the bar gets higher and higher? Or does their memory erode over time? What number of switches is this from first to second? I'm sorry, this, this one? From the really tall one to the... I mean, from the, the one under the dotted line to the really tall one over the dotted line. From that's, here to here? Yeah, that's one switch, right? Yeah. Um, so, so presumably they're doing this over and over, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so do they get exhausted over time is what I'm wondering. I don't know if you... Um, I don't think in three minutes that they do. So others have done versions that last for like 45 minutes or an hour. and then people just lapse into long periods of silence <laughs> until they remember amoeba or something and then come up with a bunch of microbes. Um, for an exact measure of uh, are they getting tired, um, I don't know that. It could be that uh, in general everything is, is slowing down. I don't remember seeing that in, in the data though. Is that the kind of thing you had in mind? Yeah, I'm wondering if, if that the, the amount by which that goes over the dotted line gets bigger and bigger that's, and bigger. That's possible. And I, more patches you go into it. That's possible. That would, and I would expect that, yeah, that it's going to take them longer to, well, first of all, so those two components that I said, it's going to start taking longer to do the second component of, of coming up with a new kind of animal, a new uh, part of the space that I haven't been to yet. So actually, that's another reason why it would be interesting to be able to pull that apart into those Because they're running stuff. out of patches. Exactly. They're running out of kinds of animals. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about the, the analogy between external and internal search. Um, and I don't know if you want to address this now or later, but, um, you know, because, like, external search, there's clearly, like, the agent is pretty uh, it's pretty clear. It's the organism itself making decisions and moving through space. But the internal search, right, you know, to avoid going into, like, a homunculus kind of argument, like, the question is, what is it that is searching? It's the brain itself is searching itself. Um, so the mechanism has to be pretty different in terms of how that's actually happening in the brain. It's not like there's like a little agent moving through, you know, different clusters of neurons looking for stuff. 
And I'm wondering then if there's maybe some, like so, I don't, you've thought about this a lot more than I, I have, but uh, it seemed possible that one kind of thing that could be going on is just like there's activity in lots of different areas and you know, some part of memory associated with farm animals is, you know, yelling loudly and, and drowning out others and as it's ebbing and firing less often, then activity from some other area can sort of break through and attention can be drawn there. Um, so anyway, I just been curious to, to know what your sort of, your kind of mental model is for how search is happening in the brain. Yep, great. That will be coming right up. Awesome. Mm -hmm. There it is. So uh, we published this work in Psychological Review, and um, then uh, Thomas Griffiths and uh, Joe Osterweil and Josh Abbott uh, came up with an alternative explanation, which is rather than foraging, going to a local space, searching there, monitoring how well you're doing, and when you're not doing well enough, leaving, doing global search to find a new patch and repeating. That's our model, the foraging model. They said, well, what about if you're just taking a random walk and you're hopping all over your semantic network? If, if that's what you're doing, would it look like the kind of output that we're getting? And so they did random walk simulations. Um, in this case, the semantic network that they used was uh, an association network, which is built up from asking people, so if you, if I say dog, what do you say next? And then people would say cat. So they were building up the network based on kind of the behavior that we're looking at. So we have uh, back and forth with them over whether or not that's the appropriate kind of random walk model to, to make. Um, but. What is missing from the random walk model is this monitoring of performance and, and ongoing success in the task. What happens in the random walk model is that um, there's a distribution of, of step sizes, and most of the steps are small. So you just randomly select from this distribution. Every once in a while, there's a big step, which would take you to some other part of the space. And so they could produce some of the kinds of patterns like that, that graph of the distribution of um, search times, inner item retrieval times, that would come out of a random walk model as well. Uh, and so then we needed to think of, well, are there other things that would distinguish these two models? And one of them is this aspect of, is there monitoring going on that is determining when the switches will happen? The random walk model makes the switch, switches happen just Randomly. And so what we are currently doing is an fMRI study in which people are doing this task in the magnet, and we are looking to see if there is an activation of brain regions associated with monitoring success, where as somebody is in a patch that we determine from what they're actually producing, do we see increasing activity of the, the monitoring going on, or maybe it's decreasing that the success is, is going down. And then when we think behaviorally people are switching, do we see activation of uh, brain circuitry involved in task switching? So that's what we're currently looking for. And we actually have now started running subjects. This is the first time in a public talk where I've been able to say that for the past too long. I've had to say, this is a study that's coming up soon. But now I can even show like the first picture from a pilot subject of doing this task and looking at the difference between the category fluency condition and a control condition, in this case where we just have the person repeating the word nothing over and over again. <laughs> so we take out you know, the actual verbal production part of it and weave in the searching and hopefully switching stuff. And so we are doing um, model-based analysis of this data to try and see if there is differential activation of brain regions when there are different things we think happening in the, the behavioral stream of words that are being produced. If there is that support for a forging model, if it looks the same 
the process, everything that people are producing, then that's more support for the random walk model, which doesn't predict that, that there is anything different going on from one jump to the next jump. Does that help? Sort of? Yes, yeah, sort of. Yeah. So there is something that's monitoring, whether you want to call that a homunculus, probably, hopefully not. <laughs> but, and that is then saying, okay, now time to reset and do a different thing. Mm -hmm. So next time I can tell you the results. All right, so we're still talking a little bit. I'll just tell you some of the other directions that we are looking at uh, search behavior in, and we can talk more about that in Q&A or, or afterwards. Zooming out to the big picture, so we're trying to understand evolved human decision mechanisms. In general, the Minds Adaptive Toolbox, focusing here specifically on search behavior and looking at whether early sp spatial search mechanisms may have been exapted and then subsequently, uh, so exapted meaning taken over for a new purpose and then uh, repurposed and selected further as secondary adaptations for use in other kinds of domains where search is going to be important. And all of this is part of a big uh, Templeton Foundation grant that we've got on looking at uh, what drives human cognitive evolution. We have others in this project looking at things like uh, whether the Invention and creation of stone tools is something that was an important driver of, of uh, cognitive evolution. Whether uh, the ability to have differential expertise between individuals was something that drives the evolution of, of human cognitive evolution. I'm looking at the search questions. So here's a few different directions. Did it go away? Uh, I'll show you more in a sec. I just wanted to briefly say one of the things that uh, I thought was cool in terms of thinking about exploration and exploitation uh, was Anne came and talked to IU about some of her new work on looking at whether or not babies are doing exploration and exploitation for finding sounds that are getting responses out of adults. So I thought that was the cool application of this idea. There's been a lot of work uh, for the past couple of decades on information foraging. Peter Paroli, Bernardo Huberman, looking at how people search online for information. And they characterize the web as being patchy, that web pages that are linked to each other have more similar information on them than ones that, that are not linked to each other. And then looking at how long do people stay in patches of web pages, and when do they decide to leave, and they found that that conforms to the marginal value theorem as well, that people are giving up when what they expect to find falls below what they expect to find on average. We've been looking at uh, some other kinds of search domains. Uh, in particular, one nice and big example is how do people search for music to listen to over time? Are they focusing locally on one kind of music for a while, and then when they get enough enjoyment out of that, or their enjoyment is diminishing, do they leave that local area and do a global search, find a new kind of music that they like for a while? In order to study that, what you need is a music space, and then you need people's trajectories through that music space. And this then allows you to see, are people like starting locally, they come into this world really liking uplifting trance, and then they try some progressive trance, and then they move down to retro electro, and back up to progressive trance, and then they get tired of that and go on through new school and over to Dutch house, and then they find actually they like the fidget house region even more. So is this what they're doing? which would be like foraging, and we could see how are they staying locally versus searching globally, or are they hopping around more randomly, taking a random walk through music space, or, or do, doing something else. And so 
Jared Lawrence, who was a grad student working with me, characterized a bunch of uh, people's listening behavior from Last FM. So nearly five billion song listens across a lot of people. Use that to create a music space. So now this is another version of a mu music space where each one of the little tiny dots on here is a different artist and they're categorized by genre and they are put closer together if more individual people listen to those two artists. The more people there were who did that, the closer those two dots for those two artists would be. And then he looked at how people are actually moving through this space because he had many years worth of listening data for each person. So you can see they listen to this song, this song, this song, this song. And how are they moving through this space? And what it looks like at a rough space, we're still digging into this volume of data, is that people are doing a lot of local search and then gradually shifting to, to more global search. This is number of listens in a row for any given person. This is how far are they moving in the music space as they go from their first listen to their second listen to their 20th to their 40th. And we'll start up here. This is a random walk. So if they were taking a random walk, they would very quickly get far away from where they started. But what they actually do is stay quite close to where they start for quite a while and then eventually get further away. So this is the kind of thing that we can start to look at to see how our people adjusting their behavior in music space, switching between local and global search or, or not. Are you looking at anything like uh, tags related to the artists? Like say the it's and flowers of that, that genre and then how close the center uh, subsequent artists are within that same genre. So really like teasing apart those businesses. Not at that level of detail and primarily, so we hope to be able to use tags to figure out distances and people really don't use tags very much. So um, it's, it's a pretty sparse behavior. We did look at another question related to tags, which is why do people tag at all? And there's different theories for that. Like they may be tagging so they can find what they tagged again themselves later. Like it's a memory retrieval tool. Or they may be tagging for other people to say, hey, here's a really good um, new school song or artist and you should come listen to this. And so we looked at when people tag something, does that increase their likelihood to listen to it? Uh, again in the future and it has a small increase but not very much so it looked to us like it's a social um, signaling purposes of, of tagging that, that people are primarily doing. Okay. I'm going to skip over that and just finish up by saying we're also looking at expanding the time scale uh, of behaviors that search may apply to. The same kind of logic should apply at longer kinds of time scales. And so ongoing projects of looking at, at search include looking at how people are shopping for different brands and when do people switch from one brand to another versus continue on with the same brand. That potentially is a patchy foraging kind of problem. We're looking at relationship search as a Apache search where being in a relationship is a patch. You're getting resources out of it. And over time, those resources may decline. And you may decide, I could get more resources somewhere else and I'm gonna switch back to searching. And so we've been looking at whether or not we see evidence for that kind of decision making going on and, and how people are, are moving from relationship to relationship. The first thing that we focused on was this prediction way back really in the talk of the longer the travel time between patches, the longer you should stay in a patch. So we're looking, do people who take longer to find a new relationship, do they stay longer in each relationship that they're in? And we found evidence that that, that is the case. And we've also, and others, uh, Colin Allen and Simon DeDeo, had, had formerly at IU, uh, have been looking at um, science as a foraging process of looking for new ideas. 
and they in particular looked at one scientist's search through the space of ideas, namely Darwin. They looked at all of the books that Darwin read and all the books that he wrote, and both sets have been digitized, and so you can look to see when Darwin went from reading one book to the next book to the next book, what was the semantic distance between each of those successive books? And did he cluster his reading at times, and then did he search more widely as he went from book to book at other times, and, and exactly those patterns they have been finding and able to show in ways that correspond to when he was producing particular scholarship and, and books himself, how his reading was clustered for a while in those the service of, of making those projects, and then when he was between projects, how it was more widely distributed across the <coughs> idea space. So those are some of the other kinds of realms where we're looking to see whether or not it's useful to apply this framework of, of search and exploration and exploitation uh, to human behavior. I'm going to skip over all the intervening slides that have a little bit of detail and just put up the conclusions. And you can look at those and I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. So, uh, really cool talk. A little frustrated I didn't stumble across your work earlier uh, in my uh, writing, but um, uh, I've been very interested in how technology shapes our foraging patterns uh, as a whole. One of the concerns that I have is that it very much so dictates the foraging patterns that we uh, uh, take. So for instance, my experience of using YouTube, uh, I'll listen to a few songs and all of a sudden I'm stuck in that cluster, right? Every recommendation has somehow reflected what I've listened to prior. So is there possibly the need or is there a desire to inject some of this, uh, what is it, some of these jumps into services that forage for you? So, you know, if YouTube is foraging through the music and video space for me, uh, would it be is there evidence that it's helpful to have injected, you know, longer jumps away from what I'm listening to? Yep. Yeah. Great question, and that is indeed one of the things that was driving Jared's interest, and still is in in this area. So the applied goal, one of the slides I skipped over, was: Can we figure out when people are ready to jump to leave one particular local patch and to go try some new things, and at that point, then stop telling them to listen to uh, the same Madonna tracks over and over and over again that they've been listening to for the last three months and, and try something different. Uh, and we don't know how well that would work yet. What we're first trying to figure out is can we tell when they are ready to leave? Mm -hmm. And then we'd be able to say, okay, now if we change things so the recommendations would help them should it be big steps? Should it be some small steps but, uh, that are gradually taking them away? What might help them? And just as a quick follow-up, is the resource that's sort of limited or being depleted there in your model novelty? Is that sort of like, once I've listened to Madonna enough times, I've eked out all novelty of the experience of listening to this one Madonna track, uh, so I have to seek elsewhere? Or is it like just exposure to something else, exhaustion, or I, I don't know how to characterize it, but what is being I, depleted in these patterns? Yeah, I think, well, so overall, it's utility, which would be enjoyment in this realm, which might be probably, enough. for lots of people, would be novelty, uh, that you have come to be able to fully predict what the next note is at each point in the song, and then you're, you know, you don't have any surprise or information gain going on with this, and that would be when you probably would want to, to have something else that's, that's more stimulating, more enjoyable. Too. So when I can play it in my head. Yeah, exactly, right. Yeah, so I, I'm, I was really fascinated by the, um, the optimal foraging model and the marginal value uh, ideas that you present. But I was wondering if you took a completely agnostic view and you, you just looked at this as a drift diffusion sort of process. So you had a plot, um, in, I think in the music stuff, where you have 
the, the mean squared distance and the time scale, yep. and you see these sort of very classic gas in the box sort of diffusion curves. Yep. So there is a sort of critical point where that diffusion curve changes its slope. Right? Yep. And I'm wondering if that is the critical point at which you kind of leave this local minimum where you're searching for something and then you switch to something else, right? So we see that kind of stuff in human postural sway, for example, okay. where you're in this sort of equilibrium for a brief period, and then you drift away, and then you go to another sort of equilibrium for a little bit. And you see these, and if you look at the long range correlation plots, you see things like Levy-like patterns. But if you look at the short range correlations, you see just sort of feedback processes that will bring you back to one stable solution. Right. So I'm just wondering if you can think of your problem as sort of a drift diffusion problem, and then identify these critical points, and then using those critical points to maybe drive um, something about the optimal foraging model itself. Yep. Uh, absolutely, that would be a nice perspective to apply, I think. Um, it <coughs> differs then from the, the kind of model of uh, monitoring how well you're doing and deciding when you're not getting enough stuff anymore and then deciding to switch. So it would be more in, well, in the random walk diffusion kind of uh, tradition. Um, and so it, that would be a good thing to compare to the more active foraging uh, perspective. And how exactly we'd be able to do that in, in for instance, the music forging or music search kind of uh, case is, is less clear since the fMRI gives us a nice way of, of trying to mechanistically get at that distinction. <clears throat> if all we have is behavior, then I think it gets a lot harder to uh, know what would be indicators of one model driving behavior or, or another one. But maybe you've come up with some techniques of what No, I'm just wondering, this is sort of following up on what Paul was saying, that yeah. maybe there are some kind of hippocampal processes that are much more sort of spatial, which are relevant to you searching um, in a space. And then there may be other medial temporal lobe processes that will sort of pull you away and say, now try over here. Right. Right. But it, with, it, with the kind of contrast that Mari design, it's very hard to pick up on where the temporal switch will happen. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd love to follow up on that to, to talk with you about which kinds of tools would be good to apply in, in particular to the music one at this point. Too. Um, so you sort of characterize this theoretical disagreement with uh, Griffiths and his co authors. Um, as a pure random walk versus a, a local local and global search. Um, but I think that um, a lot of the arguments in favor of the random walk models are not assuming that the underlying process is actually random. And, and I think even um, so with Thomas Sell, some of your papers discuss similarities between the dopaminergic reinforcement system um, and these foraging processes and, and argue that that could be the controlling mechanism so, um, I mean, if we're controlling, say, the turning rate of an organism or the, um, the hysteresis of a memory search um, using some resource monitor, but there's still a sort of, there's still a, 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 an underlying random walk model that is being controlled, um, I, I guess I'm asking, does it have to be one or the other, or, or do you see these as, uh, at some level, compatible? So. Certainly, for some of the cases, there, there could be uh, ways that both kinds of processes are involved in. And I think the, the local search could certainly be a, a random walk kind of search. It's for the cases of switching in, let's say, an abrupt way to between local search and global search, that's where we would expect to have uh, the kind of monitoring and switching processes. For the more gradual kinds of shifts away from local search to, to bigger and bigger steps, as in area-restricted search, there both of the mechanisms could certainly be at play or it could really be driven by a random walk 
with a parameter or two parameters that are, are being changed in response to, to what's going on in the environment and, and what the organism is, is getting. So out of these different kinds of search domains that I've been talking about, that would be one of the things to try to figure out too is where does it make more sense to talk about uh, a sudden kind of switch? Where does it make more sense to talk about uh, more gradual, again, area restricted search kind of not switch, but uh, gradual change from one kind of behavior to another kind of behavior. The way that we set up at least the first two uh, experiments that I talked about, there there's a switch where people are making the decision. And for a bird that's on a patch that's local that it then flies away from, that's also going to be this kind of hard switch. But for a patch where it can just stop, start taking bigger and bigger steps and gradually leaving, then we're back in the area restricted search case. So making a taxonomy of those would be this one. So it's five o'clock. So uh, let's. Uh, we can, you're welcome to stay. There's still snacks. We have the room, so informal chats can continue. But the formal part is over. So let's thank Peter Todd again.